We are proud to have Mr. Kevin Scott join us today and share his experience and expertise. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Uh, how's everybody doing? Good? I want to start off, I want to quickly tell you a story before we dive in about a friend of a friend whose name is Dave. Dave is a frequent business traveler and he was on a trip in Atlantic City, New Jersey. After his meeting, he had some time to kill before he had to catch a flight and get back home, so he went to the local hotel where he was staying to get something to eat. About the time he finished his food, a really attractive lady walked up and she asked Dave if he'd like to get something to drink. Now, Dave is single, so this is okay. Um, Dave was surprised, but he was flattered, so he said okay. And he told her what he wanted. She went up to the counter, to the bar. She ordered the two drinks. She came back. She sat down. They said cheers. They clinked their glasses together. He took a sip, and that was the last thing he remembered. At least it was the last thing he remembered until he woke up in a bathtub filled with blood and ice, and he started to freak out. He saw the vanity beside him, and there was a note that said, don't move, call 911. And he picked up his phone. His fingers were numb and clumsy from the ice, and he dialed 911, and frantically he was trying to explain to the 911 operator what was going on. And she seemed oddly familiar with the situation. And she said, sir, I want you to very slowly and carefully reach around and see if there's a tube protruding from your back. And he did, and sure enough, there was. And she said, sir, there are a ring of organ thieves going around in the city. They're harvesting kidneys. They've gotten to yours. Don't move. The paramedics are on their way. It's a crazy story, isn't it? Craziest part is it's not even true. But it's a good story, right? <laughs> because here at 4.30 in the afternoon, you guys are actually all paying attention and locked in. Yeah, yeah, surprising, right? So you just heard one of the most successful urban legends of the last 20 years. What's an urban legend? Anybody know? Urban legend, what is it? A falsehood that sounds like it could be true. A falsehood that sounds like it could be true. It's a made-up story that, that the craziest thing about these urban legends is that they are so easy to remember and be retold. So they're not true. But if you walked out of here today, you may not remember his name was Dave. You probably wouldn't remember he was in Atlantic City. But if you met somebody out there, you could probably tell most of that story. Because you'd say, there was a guy and he got something in his drink, and there was a bathtub full of ice, and somebody harvested his kidneys. Because there are elements of the stories that make them both memorable and repeatable. It's not like, man, this story just worked and this one didn't. Some of them, there, there are elements that make them work and make them successful. In the same way, when we look at a landscape of business, of entrepreneurship, there are different elements depending on what type of business you're in, depending on what your passion is, depending on your skill set. But there are certain truths and strategies that work. And they work regardless of the industry that you're in. They work regardless of your particular passion or background or skill set. And that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about today. And I definitely want to take uh, some questions at the end. But we're going to talk about these exchanges. I want to give you a little bit of background first about kind of how I, kind of how my life was changed and I became passionate about this. So I went to college and when I was an undergrad, how many of you are involved on campus in different activities outside of academics? Anybody? Okay. So there's uh, Greek life, and there's uh, campus ministries for your, whatever faith you're in, or there's political organizations, or there's intramural sports. There's so many opportunities you can get involved with. When I got to campus, my friend said, you really need to get involved in this cause that helps kids with HIV and AIDS. And it was something that I didn't know a lot about, I didn't understand. I said, you know, that, that sounds great. I'm probably a little more interested in something that helps maybe uh, kids with cancer or autism or something that I just maybe had a little bit better understanding of. Does anybody have friends they know that are really good salespeople? Okay, my buddy was a good salesperson. And so he said, let me tell you why you got to get involved. If you get involved, there's a lot of good benefits. One of the biggest is on this entire campus, 80% of the college students involved with this group are girls. <laughs> Sold. 
I'm not telling you that my motives were pure, but I ended up agreeing to help kids with AIDS so that I could hang out with girls in college. It's a good strategy, by the way. Um, it's actually how I met my wife, so it, it actually worked out pretty well. Here's what's interesting. This is what I found out. It's just interesting for you guys' context, but in the state of Georgia, there are 12,000 kids affected by HIV and AIDS. Now, I know you're saying I came for a business talk. We'll get to that, but I want you to understand this context. 12,000 kids in our state affected by HIV and AIDS. It's the second highest rate of pediatric AIDS in the country. State of New York is number one. State of Georgia is number two. These are kids, a lot of whom live within a 20, 30 mile radius of this campus who didn't do anything wrong. They didn't make any bad decisions. They were born to this world with a lot of things stacked up against them. 90% of the kids we worked with came from family incomes of $10,000 or less a year. So you have a poverty situation, you've got a health situation, you have a social stigma that you add on to it. So this really challenging life for these kids. And the program we worked with, we did a mentoring program, you and I were talking about mentors, mentoring program, and then we did one day special events. My favorite event we ever did, we turned a football stadium into a movie theater. And we brought kids up and we watched on a screen, we watched The Incredibles. And we thought they were going to be so pumped. They were getting to hang out on the football field, getting to watch The Incredibles. And here's what we found out. Most of them didn't care about the movie. They didn't care about the football field. They were excited to have a college student to hang out with for the day, somebody to call a friend. And the girl that I worked with that day, she was six years old. And what she was most excited about was free Chick-fil-A that was coming at the end of the movie. Seriously, that's all she talked about. Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A is my favorite. So when the food got there, we got her the very first sandwich, came back, kind of sat on the 50-yard line, cut it in half, and she inhaled the first half of it. And then she did something that surprised me. She wrapped the other half back up. And this was more than 10 years ago now, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember saying, like, this is what you've talked about the whole time. Don't you want to finish the rest of the sandwich? And I'll never forget what she said. She said, you know, I really do, but I want to save it for my grandmother at home who never gets to have Chick-fil-A either. And 50% of the kids we worked with had lost one parent. This little girl lost both. And for me, you made a comment when we were talking earlier about servant leadership. I know Bob Thomas, who's a professor here, is passionate about servant leadership. To me, that was a picture really of servant leadership because in her own little way, she was taking the resources that she had and leveraging them to help make other people's lives better. That's what she was doing. She was taking her resources she had and leveraging them to make other people's lives better. And it shaped the way that I viewed not only what I wanted to do, but how I wanted to lead. How do I... If I'm going to be a part of businesses, if I'm going to start businesses, if I'm going to do something, how do we create a culture where we create resources and then leverage them to make customers' lives better and to make employees' lives better? And that is something that I have tried to integrate into multiple businesses. Now we run a business in Atlanta called Addo. Addo is the Latin word for inspire. Have uh, three good friends here who interned with us last spring. So Lizzie, Savannah, and Erica, who are awesome. So um, we love what we get to do. People ask me all the time, why did you start a business? Anybody in here thinking about starting a company one day? Be interested in that? I'll tell you one of the motivating factors. A few years ago, Gallup did a study about workforce engagement. It's a huge study. Gallup studied 1.4 million people across 60,000 businesses or divisions within a business. 1.4 million people, 60,000 businesses or divisions within a business. Here's what they found out. In the American workforce, 55% of American workers are not engaged at work. 55%. Kind of depressing, isn't it? What they found out that's worse is that an additional, in addition to 55%, additional 16% are what they call actively disengaged. Okay. Jim Collins, guy that wrote Good to Great, he, he calls these onboard terrorists. They not only are not happy at work, they show up to work every day trying to figure out how to bring the place down. Not a good situation. 
You add the two together, 71% of the workforce in the United States is disengaged. Why do I want to take a 7 out of 10 chance of being disengaged? Why can't I just create the kind of future, the kind of job that I want to work in? And that was a major motivator for me in wanting to view work differently. I want to give an illustration as a backdrop and then give you four principles over the next few minutes of what I call exchanges. Exchanges are things that we've got to give up, but to do that I need your help for just a few minutes. I want to know how many of you when you were growing up you collected something? Coins, stamps, whatever. What would you, you collect? Pokemon cards. Pokemon cards, okay. You still have any of them? Somewhere in a box, somewhere in the, okay. Uh, penguins, not living ones. If you collected living penguins, that would be the coolest thing ever. So, okay. But penguin kind of statue things. What'd you collect? Coins. What, coins? Okay, awesome. From all over the world or? Yeah. Just, okay. Awesome, incredible. Whoever here collected anything? Yes, sir. Huh? Comics. Comics, okay. You still have any of those? Probably worth a lot of money right now if you had them. Okay, anybody on this side collect anything? Okay, uh, right back there. Souvenirs. Souvenirs from places that you went. Do you still keep the kind of things from different places? Okay. Shot glasses. Shot glasses, all right. How old were you when you were using them? <laughs> okay, we'll leave that out of the session. Okay, good stuff. So when I was growing up, I collected baseball cards. And don't check out on me here if you don't like baseball cards. Hold with me for just a minute. There, when I was growing up, the number one card that all of my buddies wanted was a King Griffey Jr. rookie card. It was an upper deck, 1989, aging myself here, King Griffey Jr. rookie card. And my, all my buddies wanted, and really there were about three ways you could get the card you wanted. Okay, way number one, you go to a store, they sell packs of baseball cards, usually at the front. You buy it, it's two or three bucks, you open it up, there's a stick of bubble gum in there that tastes like cardboard. Um, and then you look through and you hope you find the card you want. Okay, it's the cheapest way, but the least likely way to actually get the card you want. Never got Ken Griffey Jr. that way. Okay, way number two, you go to a store that sells collectibles. So they've got souvenirs, memorabilia, and they've got the card you want in a case or on a shelf. And it's usually in a flimsy plastic case that's then in a hard plastic case. And it has a price tag on it. It says something like $200. Okay, I don't know about you, I don't know what you like to collect, but my parents at my age when I was younger were not into spending $200 on a baseball card. So option number two is out for me. Option number three is this. I find somebody who has the card that I want and I have to put together a great card or a group of cards that I am willing to trade them to get what I want. Works for the same for Pokemon cards. You got the card you want, you got to give... And it's not just you can find your little crappy card and trade it for it. You've got to give something up that's really solid to get what you ultimately want. I find when we look at the landscape of life and leadership, the notion of sacrifice, of exchanging, of trade-offs, of giving up something to get what we really want seems a little foreign to us. We come out, a lot of times, we, we want this, but we're not willing to give up some things to get it. I'm finding to get the best things, to, to get what we want, we're going to have to make some exchanges. I want to talk about four exchanges that if you want to be a leader, if you're going to start a business, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you just want to be a great uh, person in your community, in your family, these are four exchanges that I believe are worth making. Four things today. The first one is this, it's exchanging stability for significance. So exchanging stability for significance. Question for you, how many people in here think stability is a bad thing? Okay. Most of us are not wired, I don't think stability is a terrible thing, I think we naturally, I don't think anybody got up today and they're like, man. If I had a little bit more instability in my life, that would be awesome. <laughs> like if I could just have, if my, if my bank account could be a little less stable, that'd be great. If my semester could be a little less stable, I would love that. Like we naturally want a level of stability. 
if it was giving up something bad to get something good, this would be a pointless conversation. Because the type of people who get into a school like this, who succeed, who come to events like this, the people in this room, you're not in danger of ruining your life. You're more in danger of wasting it. I mean, I just, I'm just going to be real with you. I, the people, you guys, most of you are not making decisions. Man, I'm trying to think, do I want to kind of finish this out here? Or, man, I really think if I, if I just sold drugs, that'd be a great gig. Like, that'd be a better life. Or, you know, I think, you know, just, you guys aren't deciding between something good and something bad. Your toughest decisions are going to be, man, I've got two great opportunities what am I going to trade off here? What am I going to be willing to give up? And stability is not something that we naturally want to give up, but to really get what we want, sometimes we have to strategically sacrifice stability in order to do something that's significant. I'm going to give you an example, and it does involve making less money, but I want to caution you. Giving up stability for significance does not always mean making less money. Oftentimes, though, it means giving up something that helps make you more comfortable in the short term. I graduated from college. I got a job for a congressman. I thought it was a pretty good gig because at 23, unless you're just unbelievably crazy, stupid, smart, not a lot of people are really excited about meeting with you. Just news, just being honest. At 23 and working for the congressman, they still didn't care about me, but because I worked for the congressman, it was like, now this is kind of interesting. So I got to be his representative when he was in Washington, D.C. So it's kind of a good gig. I, I got to meet with CEOs and the head of the Chamber of Commerce and the school board superintendent or the school superintendent, just people of influence in the community. I had a decent salary, not one that I loved, but it was stable at a helped me live and have my apartment. I had a pretty nice office. I had, uh, I had an eighth grader tell me that I had a legit office. It's a good measure of success for you guys. I said, how do you know if your office is legit? And they said, if you have a couch in your office. So because I not only had a desk, I had a couch, I had achieved a level of success. And the thing is, that was important to me. I liked having those. I had never actually been out of the country. And my friend came and said, let's start a study abroad program. I'm like, that sounds interesting. I've never been out of the country. So what does that look like? And he said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to quit our jobs. We're going to go spend 100 days in Africa traveling from Kenya to Cape Town overland. And we are going to set up a study abroad program where we're going to take college students on trips abroad where we can give course credit and we can do service activities. He said, you know what? I've looked at it. And most of the time, you either do study abroad where you get course credit and you take pictures and you get wasted at night, or you do like service mission trip and you get no course credit. He said, how can we do both together? I said, that sounds awesome. What does it look like? Here's what it meant. It meant giving up a paying job for a period of time for a non-paying job. It meant giving up the legit office for stealing internet at coffee shops. And it meant giving up my apartment, honestly, to move back in with my parents for a period of time. The guy that was making his decision on what student organization to join based on girls, the best way to get dates in your mid-20s is not to live at home with your parents. But it was an exchange that I felt like I needed to make. It was giving up stability to do something that I believed was significant. And it led me on a path that got me to where I am today. Here's what, that may look different for you. But every single person in here at some point in your life is going to be confronted with a decision of giving up something that leads to more stability to do something that's more significant. And when you make those exchanges, you set yourself on a path to get down the road and look back and be satisfied with where you are. Stability isn't bad. Stability, when it stands in the way of doing something significant, is where we sell ourselves short so often. So number one is this concept, this idea of we've got to be willing to, if, if we're going to make an exchange, to, and, and we're talking about entrepreneurship, but this is really life lessons, exchanging stability for significance. Here's the second one. It's exchanging expedience for excellence. So exchanging expedience for excellence. What does expedience mean? 
Speed, quickly, like let's get it done quickly. I, um, I have to be honest with you, exchanging stability for significance is a little bit easier for me. I have a high tolerance for uncertainty, a high tolerance for risk, so making that exchange, for some of you, you're like, you're with me and that's easy. Some of you, that's the hardest thing you could ever do. Others of you fall in this category. For me, if you sat around the team that worked with me today, this happened at my office today, they get frustrated because I am impatient. About 30 or 40 minutes into the meeting, start pulling out the phone, start checking. I'm, I have moved on and I'm bored. I want to get things done quickly. When somebody puts a three-hour meeting on my calendar, it makes me want to die. Just honest. Doing things quickly is not about... Who, who in here makes to-do lists in the morning? That's how you operate. You kind of make a list. Okay, how many of you be honest enough to do what I do? You make the list. It gets to about lunchtime. Sometimes you haven't done what you want to do on the list. So you go back and you write down things you have done so that you can cross them off. <laughs> so I mean, this is true. It's embarrassing. It's true. Sometimes... Embarrassing but true, I write down really easy things early in the morning on my to-do list to get a sense of satisfaction because I like this done. So I'm like, put on my clothes. Yep, it's going to be a good day. Because I want to get some momentum going early. Doing things quickly is not a problem. It's good. When your pursuit of expedience stands in the way of doing something with excellence is when we sell ourselves, our businesses, our organizations, and our ideas short. Give you a business example here. A number of years ago, Chick-fil-A had what they felt like was one of their first serious competitors. Anybody ever eaten a place called Boston Market? At the time, it was called Boston Chicken. And Chick-fil-A at that time, it wasn't they didn't think KFC or Popeyes or Bojangles or whatever. It's, it wasn't a knock to them. It just felt like they're in a different space. But man, this Boston chicken, this Boston market, man, they are selling good quality food at a good price. They have good service. They're clean environment. Man, this is a serious competitor. And they had set this goal. They wanted to be a billion dollar business in the next four years. They were taking on debt and putting locations across America so quickly. And it caused panic at Chick-fil-A's corporate office in so much that they actually had their top consultants and their executive committee come into a meeting where each of the people around the table had to prepare an idea of how Chick-fil-A could expedite their growth. How can we do it more quickly? And so they sat around the table and for two and a half hours, the late founder, Truett Cathy, listened to idea after idea. We can lower our standards for who we hire. We can speed up the hiring process and allow us to hire more quickly. We can take on some debt. We can expand our network of food suppliers so that we can grow more quickly. It was just idea, 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 idea. He sits there for two and a half hours. If you ever heard Truett speak, ever knew anything about him, was not a loud man, not a demonstrative guy. He had literally heard enough and he pounds his fist on the table. And they were like, this is not good. And he said, Y'all are missing the point. And he said, we don't need to worry about getting bigger. We need to worry about getting better. And then he said this, if we get better, our customers will demand that we get bigger. We don't need to worry about getting bigger. We need to worry about getting better. And if we get better, our customers will demand that we get bigger. Two years later, Boston Market filed for bankruptcy. They've come out of it since then. Chick-fil-A hit two bil a billion dollars in revenue. Last year hit seven billion in revenue, and they're projected to be at 10 billion by 2020. And it's, you can love, or this is not a commercial or a plug for Chick-fil-A, but they said, we're gonna focus on a level of excellence and if we do it with excellence, we're going to build something sustainable for the long term. Expedience isn't bad. Expedience, when it stands in the way of excellence, is where we sell ourselves short. I would just ask you to think about this. What does excellence look like? For, for your uh, project that you're working on, for your passion, for your idea, for your business, what does excellence look like? So number one is exchanging stability for significance. Number two is expedience for excellence. This is the third one, and this one is going to apply to everybody, but specifically for entrepreneurs. And it's exchanging acceptance for accomplishment. Exchanging acceptance for accomplishment. Okay, 
Again, acceptance is not bad. I, I hear a lot of people and they'll talk and they'll say, don't worry about what anybody thinks. Just you got to do you and you don't worry about any, what anybody thinks. If you don't worry about what anybody thinks and you're trying to sell a product and nobody likes it, probably not going to sell many of them. If you're having a service and you don't care what anybody thinks, how are you going to find somebody to buy the service? And if you're trying to have a team that works with you and none of them like you, you're probably not going to get very far. So to say that, man, acceptance, don't worry about that. You, just, you do you is not accurate. Acceptance to a certain level is good. It's when our pursuit of acceptance stands in the way of doing what we set out to accomplish. And many times people think of this in this like, if you go back to high school, like acceptance is like somebody's trying to get you to do something bad. I'll tell you, most people that struggle with acceptance are not young people, it's adults. And their biggest problem is not somebody trying to get them to do something bad, it's trying to prevent them from doing something good. You say, what, what does that look like? I, I actually call this success shaming. Now, you guys are Georgia Tech students. How many of you, you've been in a class, you've been in a group project, and the people say, why does he always care so much? God, why has she always got to work so hard? God, why did they have to do that? Well, it makes the rest of us look bad. And you think, like, oh, that's a college thing. No, that happens in the work environment all the time. Why is, why is he going the extra mile? Why is she doing that? Man, she's, she's always just whatever the boss wants. It's, and what happens is that we actually shame people for going above and beyond. And what we want them to do is not to get too far above us. We want everybody to stay in here where it feels nice and good. Your heads are nodding because you guys have experienced this. How many, so anybody ever gone to the beach and gone hunting for crabs? Okay, I know this sounds crazy, but this is so fascinating to me. Do you know that if you go to the beach, you have a flashlight at night, kind of it's on the seashore, you're trying to hunt the crabs, you got a bus bucket or a basket or a sand pail. Do you know if you end up finding one of those crabs and you put them in your bucket or basket or pail, you got to put a lid on it or you got to watch out. Why? It's going to crawl out. You've got to find a way to keep it inside there because otherwise it'll crawl out. This is fascinating. I never knew this. Didn't have much success hunting crabs. Do you know if you got two or three or four crabs and you put them in that bucket or basket or pail, you don't have to put a lid on it. Why don't you have to put a lid on it? It's exactly right. It's fascinating to watch. As one tries to crawl out, another crab will reach up grab that crab by the leg and pull it back down into the bucket, basket, or pail. Some of you, I hope this doesn't sound like your friend group. Because here's the thing, even in high achievers, we're going to be, we're George Tech, we're in a high achiever group, you know, we're in here, but even among our peers, people reward mediocrity. They don't want you to do too much. They don't want you to go too far. They want you to be down where they are. And in fact, they'll keep you in that crab basket and they'll reward you for staying in there. If you stay in there long enough, you can be student body president of the crab basket. You can be sorority president of the crab basket. If you stay in there long enough, because they will reward you for staying at a certain level. But this is the thing. Why do you put those crabs in the basket? That's... That's where they die. I mean, the crab, you don't get the crab in the crab basket because you're going to set them free and give them the new life that's so great. Life happens outside of the crab basket. And as you're thinking about what your life is going to be like, what your career is going to be like, what a business you want to start is going to be like, as you're thinking and contemplating that, the resistance you face to climb out of the crab basket will be strong, it will be immense, but life is outside of that basket and acceptance is not bad until it stands in the way of what you're trying to accomplish. And so I just want to encourage you that if you're going to think about doing something new, you will face resistance. But that the, the good that you want to accomplish is outside of there. Exchanging stability for significance, exchanging expedience for excellence, exchanging acceptance for accomplishment. I'll give you one more and I want to take some questions for a few minutes. Uh, the, the fourth one is this, and this is the most like obvious, but it's by far the toughest to implement. 
And it's the concept of exchanging the immediate for the ultimate. Exchanging the immediate for the ultimate. Here's an old quote from an old leadership guy who I think is incredible. Zig Ziglar said it this way. I love this quote if you're writing things down. He said, the chief cause of failure and unhappiness is trading what we want most for what we want now. Say it again. The chief cause of failure and unhappiness is trading what we want most for what we want now. What he's saying is this. That the number one reason if you find an adult in life who's failed and they're not, or they're not happy, it's because at some point along the way, or multiple points along the way, they knew what they wanted most and they traded that in for what they wanted right in that moment. They gave up what they wanted most for what they want now. What I want most is to do work that I'm proud of, but what I want right now is to just cash in and do what's easy. What I want most is to go and pursue that graduate degree because it, it's really, if I don't get to that level, it's not going to help me get what I really want. But what I want right now is to not go back in and have to deal with that. What I want most, maybe it's not a, a career goal. Maybe what I want most is to be a husband or a wife and raise kids. But what I want right now is to sacrifice the time with my family for a little bit more time at the office. Really, it's up to you to decide what you want most and then to make the exchanges to get there. Now, let me tell you, as just a kind of a last parting point before questions, where I find that most people who are in this boat, I was in and the boat you're in struggle, is what happens after college. Because this is the thing, the goals were clear the goal going up is I want to get a certain GPA in high school. I want to do it so well that I can get to where I really want to go. And then I want to get the degree here. And so the, the benchmark is clear and you're willing to do what you need to do to get there. Do you know that they call your generation and unfortunately mine, we're still in the same generation. One expert calls us the cafeteria generation. What the heck does that mean? And this is what he said. He said, we like to choose what we want. Now, there's a couple older people in here, so I'll pick on them for a minute. How many of you, the first way you listened to music was records? Very records? Okay. How many of you, the first way, Bob, at least you were there. There we go. The sec How many of you, the first way you listened to music was a cassette tape? Anybody cassette tape? Okay. I was cassette tapes. I want you to remember how maddening that was. If you wanted a certain song, you had to call into the radio. Some of you don't even remember this. You had to sit by the radio. You had the tape in that you wanted to record it. You had to push play and record at the exact same time. They cut off the beginning of the song. They cut off the end of it. If a new group came out with a new group of new songs and you wanted one of them, you had to buy the entire cassette tape with 10 songs. And the only song you wanted was the fourth song on the second side. And you put it in and bzzz, all the way to the end. You take it out. You flip it over. You put it into the next side. Bzzz, play. You're not there yet. Bzz, play, you're not there yet. Bzz, now you're halfway through the song, you gotta rewind. You didn't even know, like it was maddening to just get the song you wanted. Some people would start like put marks on the little cassette to know where that song was. Seriously. So they came out with CDs and it was a little bit easier because you still had to get all 10 songs, but it was just easier to get the one you wanted. Now I'm gonna use one example, you fill in the blank for the, you, the kind of music that you want, but... Um, Justin Timberlake last summer came out with Can't Stop the Feeling. How many people have that whole CD he came out with? How many people even paid for the song? Because you just, now if you want to listen to a song, you either, you're on Spotify and you have the subscription or you just go to YouTube or you find a different way to get it. So you either pay for it and only get the song you want or you don't even pay for the song. You're paying for a subscription to something or you're just getting it. You don't even have to pay for it. And what you've been able to do is say, I want this, I don't want this, I'll just take what I want and leave the rest. And this is their criticism of you and me, is that we take that mentality into our workplace. That we then show up at work and we say, here's the things I like about the job, here's the things I don't like about the job, I'll take these and leave these, thank you very much. 
and they get so frustrated. Do you know that old people sit in meetings all day about how to manage people that are our age? Seriously, you make a killing on that. Here's what's interesting. This is what I tell them every time. How many of you in high school, I'll be honest, how many of you in college, you've taken a class you thought was stupid? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you passed the class you thought was stupid? Why? Huh? Why'd you pass it? It was pretty easy. It's pretty easy, okay. Why else? Had to. Had to? Needed it for your GPA, needed to graduate? Pre rec for, Pre-rec for another class? <laughs> That's, yeah, <laughs> very good point. Here's the thing. When you understand that your goal, so if the goal is I need it to get to the next class, I need it because my GPA, I need it because if I don't do it this one, I'm going to have to take another one like this again. When you have a clear vision, I want you to catch this. When your vision is clear, the mundane becomes meaningful. When your vision is clear, the mundane becomes meaningful. Catch this. When you know what your goal is, it didn't make the class more fun. It didn't make it more reasonable. It didn't make it more enjoyable. You didn't all of a sudden say, God, I love this class now. Nothing about the class changed except for the fact that you understood that this piece was important into your overall goal. Let me tell you why most people don't make the right exchanges in life because they don't have a clear goal that they're willing to exchange something for. The, the four exchanges, the eight exchanges, they're all worthless to you until you can identify where you're trying to go. And when you have a clear vision, you'll be willing to exchange stability for significance. You'll be willing to exchange the immediate for the ultimate. When you know where you want to go, the hard work for you is determining where you want to go. Where do you want to be? What do you want to do? I want to take a few minutes. I want to take some questions um, I, I have four books, so I will give uh, four books away to the four questions. I think she has a microphone. If you'll just tell me your name, what year you are, and the question when you do it. Um, my name is Krishna. I'm a first-year undergrad. Okay. Um, what advice do you have for us to figure out what that long-term vision is? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, here, I'll hand you this, and you can come up afterwards, and I'll... Sign it for you. Um, So what advice to figure that out? I think there's a couple things that I would uh, challenge you to do, especially as a first year. So I would encourage you to do some kind of volunteering or some kind of job internship that's not necessarily in your desired field. That's not that gives you a chance to explore. Maybe it's after junior year, after you know, you're going to have to get that summer internship that's really important. How can you be exposed to some other things earlier on? I think that, because what's so fascinating to me is I walked into college with a clear goal of what I wanted, and the experience that changed my life was not a job, it wasn't a class, it was a conversation with a six-year-old on the college campus. And so if we're not involved in being exposed to other things, I don't think we give ourselves those opportunities. So that's, that would be one thing. Um, and then the second, I don't, I'm not going to draw on a whiteboard, but I think we have to have an honest conversation about where three things intersect. So I don't buy the garbage that a lot of people are selling that find out what you want to do and, and do that for the rest of your life. I think that's a lie that we've been told because, you know what, I really like to play baseball, but I sucked at baseball. So if I was still trying to play baseball right now, it would, man, I'd have no friends, it'd be embarrassing, they'd be like, you are a loser. We need to find where three things intersect. In my book, I talk about them in this way, ability, affinity, and opportunity. Ability, affinity, and opportunity. Ability is what you're good at. Affinity is what you enjoy doing, and opportunity is what does the world need. Some people still tell us, they say, find what you're good at and, and what you enjoy and do that. Well, if what you're good at and what you enjoy, the world is not willing to buy or pay for, I don't think that's a great idea. So you've got to find where those three inter- intersect, and if you're going to sacrifice one in the short term, it needs to be your affinity. 
We've got to be willing to do something that has opportunity and our ability aligns and work our way to the affinity piece, not the other way around. So that's not really the popular thing to say, but I think it's the, the tough advice that people most need to hear. Is that helpful? Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for that question. Awesome, we've got one right here. Okay, perfect, and one, oh, two more over there. Okay, those are the first four. And we'll take some more. I'll mail you a book at some point. So, okay, I guess kind of related to what he was talking about, what if there are multiple fields that we're interested in? Say we're already involved in one. Like, for example, you know, I've, I'm a what, now third-year grad student in engineering, but I am also have somewhat of an interest in business, but haven't really dipped my toes into it, which is why I'm here. But um, what are the best ways of investigating that and then determining if it's worth our time to actually pursue those roads, you know, or just stick to what we've already been doing? Yeah. It's, it's a great question. So how do you, what you're saying is, how do you get different experiences or help determine, especially if there's multiple paths and you're trying to choose? Okay. I think I would say two, two pieces of advice, and these are not groundbreaking and earth shattering. So if I, if I come up with a better answer, I'll tell you later. But here's two things I think are key. One, and it sounds really cliche, but it is about finding a mentor or somebody in some fields that can give you some insight. I think, um, I think that's an area that we often undervalue and we think about mentor as like this formal process. It could be one time having a phone call with somebody who can help give you some insight. That's one thing I think is important. The second is I really get tired of the fact that people say what's well, either this or this. It's got to be this or this. I was told for five years that we had to either decide if we were going to do business or we were going to do nonprofit. You can either do like add value to businesses or you can do something that feels like it's changing the world. And we came up with a concept we took to Chick-fil-A where we identified a business need, but we were able to solve. Uh, and I want to tell you this because I, I don't think you have to pick either or is the short version of that. We said, hey, 80% of Chick-fil-A employees around the country are under the age of 21. We want to impact those students. What if we had a way to plug into every high school in America and impact those students and then create a talent pipeline into Chick-fil-A? We get to impact 25,000 high school students across America. This fall, we're in 700 schools in 40 states. And for everybody else, it feels like a nonprofit thing, but our dollars come from Coca-Cola and Chick-fil-A's marketing department because we were able to do something that feels good but meets a business need. Engineering and business, I don't believe, have to be mutually exclusive. And I think looking for those opportunities, I think the best businesses find a way to do something uniquely better. Uniquely better. Unique, how is it different than somebody else has done it? And better, how can you do it in a way that's, that's better? If you can do something uniquely better, I, somebody said it this way, if you're the only hot dog stand in town, you don't have to have very good hot dogs. If you can find a way that's something that somebody else isn't doing, you can carve a niche where you don't really, I don't know who our competition is at this point because we've created something that's different. So hopefully that helps on that side. Okay, here and back here. We'll go up there first, sorry. We'll come right back down to you. Okay. Uh, so I was wondering, you know, in starting a business, there are a lot of obstacles for sure, and you mentioned a few of them, but how do you recommend preparing ourselves for those obstacles? Yeah, um, preparing yourself for obstacles. The only way I know how to do that is to find a way to encounter some obstacles first. And this is going to sound, our high school leadership program, one of the hallmarks of our program is failure. That sounds like, well, that's a great hallmark. But this is what we learned, that most students, we are trained to do things that just help us succeed. If I told you right now, got two professors at Georgia Tech, they're both teaching the same class. One of their classes, not going to learn a lot, it's going to be pretty boring, but they're, it's a much easier professor. The other class, it's rigorous, it's tough, your grade is probably, you're going to have to fight tooth and nail to maybe get a C, but you'll learn more than anywhere else. What class are you guys signing up for? 
I tell you which one I'm signing up for. The one that's easier. I got enough hard classes here. I got to figure out how to. So we are trained and wired to try the things that are easier. And what happens a lot of times is we're not equipped to deal with obstacles later on. If we can find environments to try things that are different where we are, then it helps prepare us a little bit more for the larger obstacles later on. I don't know exactly how to do that, but if you're, um, I am a firm believer in students get involved in charitable causes on campus. And I know that the capacity is tough from a standpoint, but I think it puts you in some of the most challenging situations. And you're, if you get passionate about the cause, you're willing to persevere over some of those obstacles. And I think it's some of the best training ground for what happens in the real world later on. So it sucks, but it's like, how do you get prepared for it? You find a way to start going through some now. And nobody, how many of you are like, man, I'm trying to find some obstacles to go through. <laughs> but that's how we do it. So, okay. Uh, Mr. Scott, thanks so much for being here. My name is Madeline Haar. I'm a fourth year business student. Um, I really resonated with um, your third exchange, the acceptance for accomplishment, especially like the success shaming. I feel like at Georgia Tech, we, we get some of that. So what is your advice for someone that transitioned out of the acceptance stage, but hasn't achieved the accomplishment stage, say they they tried to be an entrepreneur and they failed. How do you, what advice would you give them to make sure they don't revert back to the easier, comfortable acceptance and keep pushing towards accomplishment? Yeah. Again, you guys are great questions because they're not easy. Um, let's go to the acceptance side for a second. Just to anchor on that for another minute, I, I love what you're talking about going through that. I, I, I like to remember quotes and things that help motivate me. I told, so somebody was criticizing something we had done earlier, and I told somebody in our office today, I said, just remember, they don't build concrete statues for critics. Like, let them do that. Or I'll tell them, ignore the booze, they usually come from the cheap seats. So finding a way to remind yourself of kind of don't care what those other people say. On the accomplishment side, though, I do think it goes back to, a certain level of acceptance is important. And if we live in isolation, we're probably not going to have the support structure we need long term to achieve what we really want. And so it's not always easy. But I think giving up acceptance of some, you've got to then find that acceptance somewhere in some kind of a group. And some people, they find that with uh, a couple best friends. Some people find it with a business partner. Some people find it with a family member, some people find it at their church. I don't, but you got to find some way to have somebody around you who's cheering you on. And for the people that say that doesn't matter, those people eventually burn out because you've got to have some of that support system. Um, I want to just give you this on that piece. And let's see what our time is. I got a few more minutes. So one of the other exchanges kind of goes along with this. And it's this concept of exchanging fans for friends. And I won't get into all of it, but it, it's basically the idea of, in our world today, we are motivated and encouraged by a larger social network. For my business, I need more connections, more people, more opportunities for business. And uh, those aren't bad. But when I pursue those and I neglect some of my closest relationships, I end up putting myself and my business in jeopardy long term. And I'll just, some of you guys know him, but my uh, business partner pretty incredible guy, kind of crazy. He uh, was student body president, uh, did investment banking in Hong Kong, uh, used to win, he's been to like 80 countries and seven continents. When he went to Antarctica, he only wore a tuxedo so he would blend in with the penguins. So <laughs> that's Garrett. Some of you know him. Um, here's the thing. I have, Garrett is probably ambitious like no other. And I know that has a negative connotation sometimes, but he is driven. He's motivated. A few years ago, he was voted one of the 10 outstanding young people of the world. So he's accomplished a lot. And I watched him in a season a couple years ago be different than he kind of was before and after. And it was when he found out his dad had stage four colon cancer and less than a year to live. And I watched him in a season not care a whole lot about how many more awards or all of these other things. 
And what mattered during that time were some of his closest relationships and being transparent with you guys, they were relationships that he had neglected for, in pursuit of what he wanted to do. And I think they kind of go hand in hand, but if you don't have some kind of support group, some kind of structure, you won't have the accomplishment. And when tragedy strikes, you won't have the support structure you need. And a lot of people, a lot of business people, they sell out their friends and family in pursuit of their career because it's what's best for the business. And then when tragedy strikes at home, the business actually suffers because they didn't have the support structure they needed to continue to thrive in that environment. And I know some of you are like, all right, it's getting too soft around here. We're talking business. But if, if you try to separate what happens in your personal life from what happens in your professional life, they'll both end up failing. So hopefully that works. We had one more question back here. I'll take that before we go. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, uh, Sorry. Yeah, hi, my name is Keshav. I'm a first year graduate student and I wanted to ask, like, uh, I really liked your thing about the, the crab example. Uh, so um, sometimes in, in a peer group, you actually are pressured to be moderate and to not, you know, outperform those people. Huh. So and, and it feels like it, 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 uh, it becomes a sort of a trap, you know, in the sense that if you kind of uh, get, uh, outperform your peers, you are not uh, in sync with them, you know, yeah. right? and uh, then you feel lonely and all that stuff. So, uh, I mean, what could be a good solution to this kind of situation, you know? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the short answer is uh, you can't always find new peers, but find new friends. And I know that sounds like it's, it kind of goes hand in hand here. I, part of it, there's no solution for but I think you've got to purposely seek out people who are going to challenge you to be at your highest and best, not your lowest and least. And if we aren't seeking out those people, we may not find them. In, I say seek out because they don't always just show up. They're not the ones that are in our class or our group project or our social circles. We've got to find other ways to interact with them. Um, here's the thing I understand. It's a lot easier to stand up here and say it than it is to do it. Because I've been in that shoes and I, and I struggle with that sometimes too. Um, but it's taking those first steps to actively seek out those people I think is really important. So hopefully that helps. Here's the deal. I'll hang around and I'll take, uh, kind of hang up, up here and take questions at the end. I'll, I want to tell you a story just as we wrap. Um, just to kind of think about and process. Um, and I was trying to think what story I was going to tell you. I'm going to tell you the short one. I'm, I'm going to tell you this one that's really important. I'm going to tell it really fast, so hold with me. True story. No more kidney stories. <laughs> Anybody ever, ever, ever heard of a guy named Norman Borlaug? You know what he did? Uh, no, he's, he's often considered like one of the greatest people in history in terms of how many lives saved because of uh, advancements in agriculture. What's your name again? Andrew. Andrew. This is awesome. Nobody ever knows that. Andrew is a rock star. Norman Borlaug considered, he, he basically figured out how to hybridize corn and wheat so they would grow in arid climates. And because of that, you're right, they wrote a book about him called The Man Who Fed the World. They gave him a Nobel Prize, and they actually credit him with saving the lives of two billion, with a B, two billion people. So it's kind of crazy that a guy who saved the lives of two billion people and only one of two of us in the room have heard of him, right? Kind of crazy, but big deal. If you actually study the history, you find out that as awesome as Norman Borlaug was, maybe some of that credit should have gone to Henry Wallace. You may know Henry Wallace, okay. For history people, he was the second vice president under FDR. FDR had three vice presidents. Truman was his third. Henry Wallace was his second. Before that, he was secretary of agriculture. And Henry Wallace had this obsession with trying to figure out how to hybridize corn and wheat to grow in arid climates. He spent money and time and energy, he got his friends, he got a group together, he lobbied Congress, he did everything he could. He ended up getting the money allocated to set up a station in Mexico where he hired a young guy by the name of Norman Borlaug to run the station. So if you actually think about it, maybe Henry Wallace should get some of the credit. Give him the Nobel Prize, say that he helped save the lives of two billion people. Or maybe... The credit should go to George Washington Carver. Now, what's he famous for? Peanuts. Everything peanuts, all that, peanut butter and all that. What a lot of people don't know is George Washington Carver was a graduate student at Iowa State University. 
when he'd be on campus on the weekends, a professor would come with his child, and while that professor was busy, George Washington Carver spent time with the professor's kid. He took him outside, they played in the garden, he would just invest in and mentor him. He instilled in that young boy a love for agriculture and the power of plants to change the world. That young boy's name was Henry Wallace, grew up to be Vice President of the United States, hired Norman Borlaug, so if you want to get technical and think about it, maybe George Washington Carver should get a little bit of that credit. 